All right. Welcome, everyone. This is our fifth session of the day of our Activity Strong Virtual Summit, done in partnership with Link Senior, NAP, NCAP, and the Validation Training Institute. My name is Charles de Vilmoren. <clears throat> I am the CEO and co-founder of Link Senior, and I'm truly excited to introduce today's uh, fourth, actually sorry, fifth session, Creative Care, the Hope of Meaning Making and Connection in the Time of Quarantine. This session is going to be led by Katie Avila Lockmeiler, adjunct professor, University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, and Anne Bastings, founder and president of Timeslips. Before we move to the session itself, I have to cover a few household, sorry, household, housekeeping, sorry, housekeeping items, which are that today, as part of the summit, you can earn up to six NAB, NCAP, and or NCCDPCU's credits. To earn the credits, you need to attend a full session. So if you want one credit, you need to attend a full session, one session, or as many as six sessions. And you need to fill out the required post-summit CU survey, which will be emailed to you today at the end of the day after 6 p.m. on June 23rd. You need to fill out that survey before midnight on Friday, June 26th. And given the volume of the participants, the CU certificates will be emailed to you by the end of the day on Wednesday, July 1st. I also want to share the fact that this session is being recorded. So if you want to come back to it, you'll be, it will be made available for free. You can come back to our website. And if you think, and I hope, and I know you will, uh, find it interesting, please feel free to share it with your friends and coworker. Um, I think, yeah. The third aspect is about the technology, as we've had quite a few questions today. The webinar itself is uh, using Zoom webinar, and you can also access the presentation through Facebook Live. And you're more than welcome to engage on both. But to, in order for you to get the CEUs, you have to be at least on the Zoom platform. Talking about technology, as you've probably discovered, Zoom has two features, a chat feature and a Q&A feature. And given the sheer number and volume of a conversation, we cannot monitor the chat, although we do look at it and love to see the comments. The Q&A feature is the feature we will use to filter the, um, the questions. So Katie and Anne, I hope you're, you can see that. We will try to help you monitor these. And everything that is technology or CU related, we will answer and dismiss. The last item I want to share is that the bingo word for this session is the word R. As we've had many questions about what is this word about, the bingo game is a, a game we've put together. You can find the card itself on our Facebook group and or our website, activitiesstrong.com. So with that, I wanted, you to, I wanted to introduce you both to, uh, I'm sorry, I wanted to, to introduce you to both of the speakers today. Katie Avila Lockmeiler, again, she's the adjunct professor of University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and the famous Anne Basings, founder and president of Timeslips. I'll switch to your deck, both of you. And again, feel free to just say next, and I will advance the slides. And I'm going to turn off my video so um, we can really focus on your presentation. Thank you both. Thank you, Charles. Um, and uh, I'll, let's practice that. Next. You can there, you there you go. I, there we go. We did it. We did it. I'm actually. Yes. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and really, really honored and happy that Katie had the time in her schedule to join us today. It's been, um, I'll also say that I'm also a professor at UWM and that's um, also living in Milwaukee and Katie and I have had a great opportunity to work together on several pro programs and projects around town, um, building community through the arts. Um, 
it's been a fascinating day. Holy moly. I'm really glad that there's uh, 1362 of you online still uh, at the end of the day. I had the great um, pleasure of having a relatively free day so I could come in and hear um, the context of what our presentation is. Um, uh, creative care, uh, the hope of meaning making. Uh, we really, um, I was very struck by Kenya's talk this morning about um, seeing all of these challenges of this moment, which are, there are many challenges of this moment. Um, the disparities that have been laid bare by COVID um, and the ongoing challenges and the cracks in all the various systems that um, we see opportunity there. And the opportunity um, I think that we're really looking at is how as we are protecting these lives um, and I just want to commend everyone in a care profession who is pr protecting lives whether it's home care or in congregate settings as as the activity professionals are um, that we are protecting lives that we want to make sure that those lives also have meaning to them um, otherwise why are we protecting what is the purpose of our lives that we are protecting? Um, and the, that, that we really find hope and we're, we're seeing so clearly for the first time, well, not for the first time, we're, we're just seeing it much more pronounced, that connection to other human beings is, is an essential need of humanity. Um, and I think that's something that we can carry through this moment um, to, the, to the end that what we do in connecting each other um, as activity professionals is, is necessary to, to human thriving. Um, that is something I think we really um, can keep with us and emphasize all the way through. Um, today, um, I uh, wanted to give you just a little bit of a background for, for those of you who might not be familiar with the, the time slips approach. And creative care comes actually from the title of a, of a book that just recently came out um, that I did in, in May out by Harper. Um, it, it, it really revolves around a shift from seeing care, which has really traditionally been identified with loss. Um, sort of that misnomer of the empty vessel model of care where one person is empty and the other is full and filling the other person to shifting that to identifying strengths and how to build on the strengths of the other person so that it becomes a reciprocal relational relationship of care that is productive and generative and adds new, new, something new and meaningful to the world. That's what happens when you bring creativity and care together. And I also noticed in some chat earlier in some of the sessions that people are like, I don't, I'm not creative at all. If you can breathe, you are a creative human being. Creativity is an innate feature. I think what's happened where people have distanced themselves from thinking they have creative capacity is that the arts have kind of become professionalized and, and removed from our everyday lives when actually we can manipulate and manage and arrange words, sounds, line and color, movement and gesture, all of those things are using the emotional and symbolic language of the arts and we have the creative capacity to do that. So I just want to build that creative confidence in all of you um, as we move forward. So time slips brings meaning and joy to late life by infusing creativity into care relationships and systems across the world. We, we, you can learn to use programming to engage and enrich the lives of elders, caregivers, families, and volunteers. We really think that you can't do it alone. You can guide it, but you can engage, do programming that is so interesting that the families want to participate with the elder. This is really challenging. Um, this has been our approach all along been really challenging in the moment of COVID. Um, but as some of the other folks have said, that this has been one of the most creative moments I've witnessed in my life as people have been um, adjusting to all of the obstacles that are put up before them and coming up with creative solution one after the other after the other to figure out how can we bring meaningful engagement 
how can we connect with each other? How can we make sure our elders are connected to their family members? It's exhausting. I can hear the exhaustion in your writing, um, but it also is what, if we can figure it out, it's what enriches us as care providers as well. Um, next slide. Um, this is just a little snapshot, again, of time slips. Um, we have training, some of you have probably heard of us. What you really need to know is that in the last four months, the time slips team has been just working overtime to bring free materials to folks who are, um, who, and it's on our resource page so that you can just download material. We have the Creativity Center, which has over 400 prompts on it. Um, logging in is free. You can use it to, in, you can download worksheets and print them. There's just, just a wealth of materials there to support you in creative care practices. We have over 900 certified facilitators now in 48 states and 20 countries reaching well over 50,000. It's our perennial challenge to figure out how to track just how many elders we're reaching per year. With over 7,000 logged in users and over 17,000 stories that people use our website in order to track and publish their stories. Go ahead, next slide, Charles. We, are, uh, we invite engagement from um, family members. Uh, so we're supporting family members. And one thing that you'll see coming out from us in the next couple of months is our engagement parties, which are meant to be a fun way for families and friends to learn the basic techniques of creative engagement, free, all downloadable free material for them to do almost like a little Tupperware party, an engagement party, so that family members can learn a positive strength-based engagement technique to use with their loved ones. Students, which we'll be talking about, Katie and I work together on the Student Artist in Residence program, and that's going to be the focus of the work that we share with you today, and then organizations as well. Go ahead. Next slide. Um, our, our approach, we're really lucky that our training has been online since 2011 and that people have been able to replicate it and then that enabled people to study it. So there's a lot of evidence base out there about our improvisational approach, um, increasing the well-being of elders, increasing re uh, and improving relationships between staff and elders, um, positive social engagement and improving attitudes among um, staff volunteers, including a lot of the students that we'll, we'll focus on today. Go ahead. So here's the meat of the program that we're going to share with you today. It's what we call next gen because we're believers that if we really want to change and make creative care the normal in the way that we offer programming to people, that, it, that it's generative, that it's not based on passiveness, but also actually co-creative and reciprocal, that it's um, uh, building on strengths and um, offering something beautiful to the world. Uh, we like to say beauty and meaning can happen um, all the way to the end of life. Um, we believe you have to go upstream and train students and that they can be part of um, our volunteer corps in a meaningful way in this time that we find ourselves as everybody has been um, sharing concerned about reduction in staff you already don't have enough staff to offer programming but that we're really facing continued decreases in staffing and support um, that students, um, volunteers, and service learning can be part of that team to help you. Um, we have two models of that at Time Slips. One is a traditional semester-based long one where they learn the creative storytelling approach, uh, the improvisational approach, and then they offer it. Um, now people have been doing it by phone through our Tell the Stories program or uh, Zoom sessions. Um, or a year-long immersive program called the Student Artist in Residence Program, where students get room and board and they actually become residents. So they occupy this interesting space between neighbor, staff, uh, residents themselves, 
um, in order to really guide community building and connection through using arts-based and creative techniques. And here is where I hand it over to Katie. Katie spent um, all last year guiding our students through this program um, that we have just some incredible stories to share with you. And our hope afterwards, I'll tell you where the next year's program is um, in order to um, see that it is possible to do this in a moment of COVID. Our collaborative partners are doing it. So keep that in mind as Katie shares the program. Next slide. All right, yeah, so um, just a little bit of background on me and like why this slide develops. I um, myself identify as an interdisciplinary social practice artist. So um, basically that's how I framed the class for the last year and a half as I was teaching it. Um, so as you see, like there's just this, these three buckets that come together under an artist and then for this class or for this program, the student artists and residents. So it's the community, the, the older adults themselves, um, obviously the art um, and then the institution and the, the, the sayer has to really balance all, th all three of those. And so I'll kind of quickly kind of run through like the um, each of our students projects to kind of show you how that plays out and, and where, where there's successes and sometimes where there's room for improvement. So um, next slide. So our first um, student that we're, I'll talk about was Andrew Gray. He was uh, actually a, a SARE for two years. So it was really amazing to see him grow over the last two years. Um, and obviously, and he was at the same site for the two years. So he really, really got to dig in deep and really build that community piece. Um, for the class, I for new SARES, I always sort of ask them to do a lot of observation work, both like just being engaged with the community. And so that the, the students aren't making art at, um, at at their community but with their community and that's um, a really big piece of how it how our students were successful that they were really responding to needs instead of um, just deciding what they wanted to do um, I actually remember the first year I I kind of came in halfway through the semester and one student had proposed this workshop and I just asked her why she was doing it. And she honestly had no idea. <laughs> she just was like, I don't know, this could be fun. And, um, but then when she started to think about what can we, what, 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 what do they want, she then was able to develop something really great. So Andrew was able to do a lots of really great things. And I think one thing that he did really well was really um, create workshops that were theme based that like were exciting. So he had everything from Mr. Rogers themes or mystery themes to uh, even some kind of more serious where it was writing legacy letters, which um, um, and what I also loved about his workshops is that he was really coming at it at an approach with he was doing the workshops with them. So for those legacy writers, here it is, do it. He was like, let's sit down and do this together. I'm going to write one too, and I'm going to share. And that allows people to open up. And again, kind of what Anne said, we're all like anybody non, uh, not in the arts uh, or not an artist feels like they don't have any, that they, they aren't artistic or are afraid to, to, to play. And so this, the, uh, the, the job of the SARE is to grant access to that. So another, um, just to note the photo is um, he actually also worked with a resident to do a play. And this was the second play or the, uh, the part two of a play that one of the residents wrote before. Um, so Andrew just kind of came in with his theater background and brought his energy and excitement. But again, it was the really the collaboration between the two. So next slide. Um, so yes, yeah, so the next slide is Angela. She also was um, somebody who was a SARE for two year, two academic years, and she was our actually a grad student, um, and she actually switched locations. So this is her at um, her second location, um, and I just it was really fun to also watch her like. Um, progress in, in her time there. And she did what was really good. Not only did she do a lot of the work to um, see what the community needed, but the institution itself and doing some asset mapping. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see uh, this space that she carved out and said, 
this is a wall that there's nothing here. How can we engage this space? So she turned this into a little art gallery and started really simple, like just this, just a prompt, like, what do you wish for? And cut out these stars and made this beautiful installation that was temporary to not only activate the space, but also activate um, the, the residents in what they wanted, not in, in their space, in their lives. Um, and so that was like a really simple uh, project. And then if you go to the next slide, she um, started kind of going more abstract. Okay, well, well now what do we think about circles and colors and, um, and whatnot. And so, and then what I love about this is that each person kind of did their own. And then as uh, Angela took that all together and then displayed it. So I actually want to read a quote that she kind of talked about this from Angela. Um, With my experience as an exhibiting fine artist and object maker, I transform their individual artistic expressions into a visual of our communal accomplishment. These large collaborative artworks literally represent the beauty of community and become a source of pride for all. And I just really loved that reflection on how, how her as an artist can put that lens and turn something really simple into something really, really uh, beautiful and where everyone has pride and, um, and also where the staff can be engaged too. You know, obviously that is a really important piece that I'll get into a little bit later, but next slide. Um, yeah, and this is another example from Angela, just, um, and this is kind of what we call like a passive project. She set up her, her typewriter and had sort of a prompt of, you know, just sharing a story and um, people could just come sit down, share something and she would collect it and again, turn it into an, um, a, into an installation piece. Next slide. Um, and then this is again another kind of more complicated um, and again like I think the layering effect it's like that's really nice about a like a whole year you can kind of start with the simple just write down what you're thinking about to okay now let's like slowly work in the more complicated or more complex projects um, and I think that 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 is a really great way to look at it just going easy at first and then step by step getting into more complicated. So this was more of a um, like a paper folding project, still pretty simple for for most people to do, um, but still, I, I think a little bit more on the abstract field. But again, each person made this and then she created the installation with all of these little pieces. Next slide. Um, so yeah, so our next student is Danielle. Um, Danielle was actually, um, this was, I think, really great, particularly probably for folks joining in. So she is majoring in occupational studies with an emphasis in therapeutic recreation, minoring in psychology, and earning a certificate in healthy aging. So she did not come into this as um, from the artist's mind, but she was really wanting to build creative confidence within herself. And then, um, which I think also was really great because she was able to do that kind of in tandem with her residents and her community. Um, and I think she was somebody who really, learned like probably in a great way as she wants to like kind of continue with this this work um but more on the occupational studies as, or occupational work side of things and not as artists i think it was really great for her to come in and and learn what is really needed in terms of an someone coming in that's outside of the community and again that 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 piece between community institution and artist or art that that's really key and there does need to be support there for an artist or a student artist and resident um, to make that connection really strong and to make the work really strong. So if you go to the next slide, um, there, this was, a, this was actually a great, so she actually started, so this was kind of what the end result, so we're kind of working backwards, but she started just a welcome club. So she actually at first just did a lot of like observational work and then working with, asking them what they wanted or what they saw. And she got a core group of people who said, you know, we have new people who come in all the time. It would be really cool if we just gave them cards to welcome them. I would have liked that when I came. And so she was like, great, we'll start with cards. And then again, slowly layered. And then all of a sudden she was like, okay, well, what if we collaged, you know? And it was like a very simple, like, 
I kind of joke like it's a sneak attack to like getting to really high level work because um, then as it went from card making to then just kind of abstract collage making. And then the one on the right, I love this. He just, I actually was there during this session. He ended up writing this beautiful poem from found words from a book. So it was kind of, um, again, the, the layering is, is really important. Next slide. So yeah, these are just more examples. You can go to the next slide. Um, and these, yeah, these were the, the cards. So they started with welcome cards and then they created thank you cards and holiday cards. And, and it became a really tight knit group. Um, and that was, um, again, really, I think, again, like she also, I remember having her having trouble finding space. So that's another thing where in, like the, the people on the ground working with uh, the series, it's really important that they get the supports so that they have the correct space and they have, um, cause I remember she had a, she ended up having sort of a, a space where there was a loud noises in the room was of course with older adults, that's really difficult. So she, I mean, she worked around it and she uh, luckily I think all of our students were kind of resilient as particularly as things very much changed when they couldn't even be in the same room with the, one another. But um, I think it's just that, that a reminder that the, the site really has to be on board with this work for it to work. Next slide. Um, so this was our dancer. This one, I was really excited. Her name is Jessica uh, Woolridge and she um, was bringing dance, uh, which was, and I think she wasn't really sure she has a history of teaching dance to younger folks, um, but came in really excited to work with a new population and modify um, her, her teaching experience with older adults. And I, I love this because I think as much as every, all of the, the community members across sites are always sort of apprehensive when, when faced with like a, a creative activity, particularly if it's not like pitched as a class, but like, hey, we're going to make something. I think dance was definitely like, no way, I'm not gonna do it. Um, and I remember that one time when I did my site visit with Jessica, like all of the they like sat and like they sat as far away as possible and she had to like slowly bring them in but you know and by the end they were they just loved it because dance is just movement you can do like you don't even have to get up you can if you can go like this then you can go like this if you can only put your hand up a little bit that's still that's still dance and movement and so she experimented a lot with also like you know adding movements to poems and kind of getting other arts uh, integrated into her workshops. And she actually really um, trends once COVID hit and she couldn't be no longer be in the in her site, she ended up making these videos and they actually translated really, really well. Um, and they got to go on screen. So people got to do the same thing from from inside their rooms with watching her videos. Next slide. Um, and this was just her, she always sort of had conversations. So um, I know it's a little bit difficult to see, but she um, would kind of just get people warmed up to the idea of whatever she was teaching. So there were some classes where she really specifically um, would teach, you know, modern dance or ballet or African dance and then, or even just stretching. Um, and then the other times there was one where she was like, okay, wh like, what are you see in photos? Just trying to get people, their minds kind of going before moving, which I really loved that, that juxtaposition of mind work than body work. Next slide. Yes, yeah, so of course, uh, that yeah, this was just her just sort of going, uh, I think a slide of her doing the remote videos and they were kind of in announcements. Um, so we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. So next slide. Um, so this was another, Je our other Jessica um, and she did um, a lot of great work as well. And I think she also was somebody who really, um, there was such a need and love of 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 the art the student artist residents doing work but also she was one of our students that we really learned how important boundary setting is because sometimes they um because they aren't our sayers aren't full-time staff although they uh sometimes people are just so excited about throwing ideas their way um and she took on too much too soon and then it wasn't sustainable so it's really important again 
being honest about what is uh, the capacity. And so, but what was really great about um, Jessica, and you can go to the next slide as I talk, um, she really engaged her residents to also take leads. So she started, so she did paper making, but there was actually, she found out a lot of people knew how to paper make so uh, or make paper. So she actually not only led her own workshop, but allowed another resident to like Skillshare. So I think that's another thing that actually uh, many of the um, student artists and residents saw is that there was there was skill sharing that could be happening between between residents, um, and that and that gave them they really ran with it. Particularly in just this Jessica's case, uh, they had like a team of artists who just were like very excited, and then they created Sculpture Club and. This um, one man was excited and made a book that they were going to sell, and then activated a whole group to make books. And it didn't, and that was really great because Jessica, you know, is no longer a, a student anymore, but she like ha her that legacy kind of will will live on um, because she it was able to just get wheels turning. Next slide. And yeah, and this was also uh, this was. Uh, an example of her work in memory care, uh, the memory care unit. And so kind of also just doing simple things and tangible things. I liked a lot of her work. She was really focused on object making, but just simple things that people could do. So I think, you know, if you ha depending on what the population is, being able to kind of readjust activities and meet people where they're at. Again, that relationship building is really key. Um, and that's why the SARE program is so great because that you can really figure out what the, figure out your, learn about your community and what their capabilities are over a period of time and adjust accordingly. Next slide. Uh, so this, and this is our last one that I believe I'll talk about. And this is Eleanor. Eleanor um, was uh, our theater, another theater major who ended up doing a um, a play with her her group of people, which was really exciting. They had do a play at a high point every year. And so she brought in, again, was collaborating both with her. And um, I don't think I mentioned, but each, um, each SARE, had a point person, which we called their mentors. And that person, um, the more involved they were in, the better results they saw. And I think Eleanor was like a really good example of having just a really beautiful and strong connection with her mentor so that they, um, and then they worked really, really hand in hand on making the, the play possible. And then also there was a volunteer that always helped. So like managing that relationship and then um, being able to, you know, then put on this production as a collaborative team with, with the community at, um, at her site. Next slide. Um, and I think, and while I'm the next, so yeah, so it was Esther the prequel, which they, um, I wrote really together and got input. I was uh, actually able to go to the, the first reading of it and then see the actual production. And it was really amazing to see that it grow. And it was like only done within three, two or three months. So it was actually a fairly quick turnaround. Um, and I actually wanted to read a quote from Eleanor as well. Um, She's like, I, she said, I could not have done any of this without the support of the administration and staff. From the beginning, they were so supportive and celebrated everything I did. I felt championed and that gave me permission to do something as daring as a musical. So again, I just wanna emphasize how important the relationship, not only to obviously the community members, but the staff too. And I think um, uh, that, that also definitely translated into um, when everyone was kind of figuring out how to virtually connect. So figuring out, okay, who can do phone? Does anybody have video or internet uh, capabilities? Is who can I write to? Um, that was like really important for all our students to, to manage all of that through their mentor or, or staff um, relationships. Uh, next slide. And I think actually that's, it um, for all the student work, and I will pass it back to Anne. And I'm uh, and I'm sure I will have something to say after Anne too, because I feel like I missed a couple of things. But 
Yeah, I think there have been some um, questions about just the shape of the SARE program and how it works. Um, and we can do we can do this. Um, the the um, one of the main things is that there's two types of student artist in residence sites. One <clears throat> is the room and board site where they move in. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and get room and board for the year. That is their scholarship. That is their, um, they, they have a lease with the, with the site um, and they move in uh, and they're there for a year. It's a huge scholarship for them. Um, they have two mentors. They have an elder mentor and a um, staff mentor. And they um, spend the first month in observation. Just, we, we train them in asset mapping so they learn um, where the where the leadership is, how the organization is structured. A lot of these students have never set foot in a care community or a long term. They have no exposure to long term care whatsoever, um, and so they they learn the community and the structure under the guidance of their mentors. Um, the um, then after that first observation period, they they um, go through training. They have a, a faculty member, Kat, Katie was that person over the year, who meets with them every other week for 90 minutes to go through um, certain training techniques. Um, they learn the time slips approach. They learn um, how to design uh, a workshop. They learn all kinds of different things. Um, and they're not expected to be experts in any kind of artistic expression. They work with their mentor to identify a challenge at that, um, that community. Um, oftentimes that challenge is um, we need to better integrate people with dementia into the larger community or um, new residents need to be integrated. Um, we need, um, we could use uh, workshops to help staff um, feel empowered at different levels and to collaborate with residents more or to integrate family members in. In this moment of COVID, you can imagine a hundred different challenges that the organizations would face. And then that challenge is what guides all of the programming for that year. That is what the student um, figures out how each uh, two workshops per month is their uh, requirement. And then they um, are also required just to spend five hours of time being a neighbor, um, either eating or something. We, we have challenges now with COVID for this program of figuring out how to do that. That might be talking to people on the phone. It might be offering Zoom sessions. It might, you know, some other way of, of being a neighbor. Um, so the other sites are stipend sites where the students don't live on, but they have the same um, commitments and requirements. Uh, they get, I think it's uh, $750 a semester um, in order to, to have five hours a week of being a neighbor and two um, workshops per month. Um, so that's, uh, that's the basic structure of it. Um, in the end of the year, they collaborate um, to showcase the work that was done all year long in what we call the Flourish Festival. Um, we've done it in galleries before and invited um, each care community has sent a, a busload of folks to come, family members come and jointly celebrate. This year we did it by doing, um, by doing it through a Zoom session and you can see the recording of that session um, on the Time Slips resource page. Um, the, the format here is what we're just suggesting as a way for a meaningful way for um, college students in particular um, to be, become part of the community and part of your team uh, in order to help with this. The, um, at, you, can, um, you can forward the slide, Charles. And Anne, just I want to just chime in because I think I saw a question about like if they got school credit as well, and they did. I think that we kind of increased the credit like incrementally, um, just because there is so much work they can be doing. But we also wanted to keep it not a full course load, so we actually met inside our classroom every other week, and it really became more of just like assessing and problem solving in within the group. Um, so we met every other week, um, and I believe it was like one or two credits depending um, on the student. And that really helped um, 
them come back and and kind of assess what they were what they were doing um, and and help each other um, and and then it's always validating to know uh, whether they're having this when they have similar problems or similar areas where they they need some other brains in the room to to think through things and I and the thing I really wanted to mention that I didn't was that um, well as you can see there there was just like such a amazing projects that these students created and sometimes really, really beautiful. I it was really, really important that it was not, uh, their goal was not the product, it was the process. So, um, and that is really key. And even if you're not, uh, if you're even looking at it from an activities uh, coordinator position and you don't feel like you um, are like the best artist in the world, there's still like, think about the, the process um, and instead of that end product goal, because that can kind of then, because the end product sometimes just doesn't really even matter. It's about like going, working together and again, building that relationship through the activity, not, okay, I have this beautiful, you know, painting at the end of it, which can be nice and exciting. And especially if you hang it up, it can bring joy. And I'm not saying to not to diminishing a beautiful product, but, but really, again, just really focusing on the process. Charles, are you able to, to forward the slide? Hopefully. Um, I'm seeing some people who are, who are saying we, we just can't have students in the building. The, this, the student artist in residence program is a little unique in that they are, um, they're, they're residents. They're, they're categorized as staff and treated as staff or residents. So um, the sites that we have, they've all selected, we go through a recruitment process for the student artists and residents. Um, this is being done at multiple campuses across the country. The, there is no cost to the long-term care community at all. Um, if there is a training, if they go through the time slips model, they, some places are doing it on their own, but if they go through the time slips model, there is a very low cost for access for the students to the training. Um, the, um, the uh, let's see, what else was I gonna tell you? Um, the, the care homes that are participating coming uh, in this coming year have selected their student artist and residents and are, bringing them in as residents to independent living. Um, and then they are offering, uh, some of them are doing assisted living, um, getting room and board in the assisted living. And um, they are, they're doing it. Um, so they become, they're treated as um, staff. Um, they're trained as staff, their, their time is overseen that way. Um, it's, they can also do virtual visits by phone visits. They can be part of that. Um, so there you go. Um, Charles, I'm, I'm not sure if you're able to forward or not. Yeah, I am, Anne, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> For some reason, my, my landline dropped. Uh, there's a video on this slide. You don't want the video. Yeah, right? you want we, the... can, we okay. can watch that if people want to, if we have a few minutes to see it, if people want to see it. And then um, I think... Uh, the the audio will come from your your computer. Okay. So let me uh, let me play you then. Okay. Let me know if you can hear it correctly or if you can't. So this is from um, Oral Roberts University and collaborating with Methodist Oklahoma Methodist Man. Time Slips is a program that we are partnering with ORU where we do drama therapy workshops for the elders that live in the health center. Right now we have one student artist in residence, Rebecca, that lives on campus and provides these workshops with um, Professor Sweeney. Our Time Slips student artist in residence this year is Rebecca Wood. She's leading storytelling workshops. We're having them just every couple of weeks, and I'm facilitating with her. We're devising stories with the residents. I would start by saying, hello, everybody. Welcome to storytelling. We would start off with a warm-up. Then we would get into the main activity, which is the storytelling part. I would hand them out a picture at the beginning. She has pictures, and, and we even start in mentally 
building a story before she gets to the story. I think Joe and I are the ones that speak out the loudest. We get it started and then they follow. Sometimes I'm adding to what I already have in my past. In her hands. Yeah, right over here. Oh, I wasn't thinking of that when I was thinking. Then I would start by asking questions like, what do you think is going on in this situation? Who are they? They have a family? Like, simple questions like that. It's not just a passive workshop. She really wants them to be engaged and it be a reciprocal event. And then it all culminates in a final performance in which we will have ORU theater students come and enact the stories that have been written together. I like chicken. I think they should come inside. No, ma'am. Why not? Bugs in the house. Bugs are already here. Maybe the chickens will eat them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you perform that part of it? They do an excellent job. You have your extroverts that, you know, love to tell stories and love to talk and, you know, kind of shine in some of these programs and all of your events, but it's those people that you don't expect to shine that are coming out of their bubble and out of their shell, and it's amazing. We had a member that when she moved in, the way that her dementia presented itself was she cried. I love hearing these stories. And she read a story. The first sentence, it was kind of her voice was trembling because she was anxious and about that. But she finished the story without that trembling in her voice. And so to sit there and watch that, to know that this program has helped her come over that, it, it's just so moving. And those are the kind of the behind the scenes things that you don't necessarily see. It's impacting people's lives. And to use theater for a purpose that is helping people and making them grow and become more interactive is amazing thing to be able to be a part of. Those with dementia or physical ailments or disabilities have something to contribute, have something to share. Time Flip celebrates that and gives an experience to all generations to share creativity and celebrate the elders and, and what they can bring to all of us. Sorry for those of you who had trouble hearing that. Um, I wanted to, and if you can go to the next slide, Charles. Um, so all care settings are, are we, we were very careful. We sat down with the student artists um, and the, um, the care homes this coming year. There are, um, I think, five sites. And they, we wanted a plan A, plan B, because universities may, may declare only teaching online, in which case will the students even come to, to value having room and board in a city where they're not going to be required to be. So if that happens, that's, that's the, the variability from the campus side. And then from the um, care community side, what happens if the, the care community locks down again? Can the students go to their classes? Can they get out of the building? How are they considered? Are they staff or are they residents? Um, how are their movements gonna be restricted? And so we, we carefully planned out a plan A, plan B, plan C for all these things and made sure that whatever happens, um, the care, it works for the care community and for the student as well. Um, the um, some of the sessions we are um, time slips is doing a free institute on July 15th and 16th um, uh, on adapting to all online um, engagement from and we emphasize um, uh, phone uh, through telestories and um, mail and then also smart technology and then window work. Um, so that we have um, all, all of those, um, that we, we're following one project idea through all of those in the, the, um, the summer, the Institute on July 15th and 16th. If you're interested in that, um, just email info at timeslips.org and you can participate in that. Um, we've done sessions um, guided by Zoom for small groups or individuals. Uh, again, on, on the Time Slips resource page, there's all kinds of um, videos guiding people through little creative sessions. 
um, that are about 20, 30 minutes long and can be done individually or with groups as well. Um, we have tons of downloadable story sheets there that can be printed and then sent out to individuals' rooms. Um, let's see, what else? Um, that is, uh, let's see if there's a next slide. And there was a question, do you partner with other universities? Yes, yeah, so University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee is just where I teach and where the program has been running almost as like a lab for about mm -hmm. six years now. Um, we, um, Time Slips as a nonprofit guides and coaches any university or campus or um, high school students across the, across the country. Um, and some folks have said that they know of other programs and there are programs that are running um, that we know for sure. Um, Judson uh, in Cleveland has been doing this for a while with um, graduate student music, uh, musicians, stu musicians who get room and board for basically practicing uh, in, um, in the care communities, which, which could actually be done now as well because the music carries and you can hear the sound. It's just a wonderful thing. Um, the, uh, and, and, and Oral Roberts University in, in Oklahoma is um, one of our sites. There's about 13 sites across the country now that we're collaborating with. Um, a little bit more just of where we are um, as far as where, where we're hoping to get to, and I think we all share this same vision, that we infuse meaningful engagement into every care system. Um, it should just be how we care for people. Um, hmm. That we can get to a point, and I, I remember somebody writing before that, that activities should be billable. And we really need to get to that place because we know that isolation, um, things that, that keep people separated, uh, isolation has profound negative health impacts and that any activity that um, ends isolation and integrates people into community and generates a sense of belonging and purpose um, actually improves people's health and well-being. Um, there is a movement in this country towards social prescription uh, which is also part of, I think, our long-term goals. And then uh, we are on the anti-ageism and anti-ableism uh, bandwagon that by bringing youth into meaningful engagement with elders, we can do a lot to disrupt ageism as it's forming, uh, which is, I think, one of the most powerful things that comes out of the surveys of the students who go through this program, that they really have their lives changed. Um, any other questions that you're seeing in the chat? Um, I mean, I have one regarding social prescription, which is, um, you know, I think that anyone in activities in this discipline is, is very, uh, I mean, that's, that is an, an end goal by itself, right? What do you see? I mean, what, I'm sorry, let me phrase the question. In the past three, four years, what have you seen positive going in that direction? And what are the one, two, three blocks that you're seeing there? Towards social prescription in particular? Yeah. Is that, is that yeah. what you're thinking? Um, yeah. We have a tremendously fractured healthcare system <laughs> yeah. that doesn't yeah. value prevention. Uh, and uh, that's the problem. Uh, if we valued prevention, we'd be doing things a lot differently in this country. Uh, yeah. We tremendously differently. Um, but we, we wait till the last minute to intervene with high cost interventions that um, really don't make a lot of sense. Um, uh, we don't want to give those up because they are interventions that can save people's lives, but we need to figure out a way to rebalance to emphasize um, prevention. Uh, the arts and culture sector have uh, really in the last 10 years become so much um, more aware of their benefit to older adults and people with dementia in particular. There have been a lot of vibrant collaborations. Um, there's a lot of stories I tell in creative care about those collaborations, some of which I've been involved with. Um, one is a, a 12 nursing home collaboration across rural Kentucky, where for two years we've reimagined the story of Peter Pan and, yeah, uh, and then staged a, a performance. So I think that 
um, the turning long-term care communities into cultural institutions and, co and fostering collaborations between cultural institutions and long-term care communities is really um, the long the long-range goal so that people's the fullness of people's um, purpose and uh, humanity can can grow all the way to the end um, again I started out this whole thing by saying how are we protecting uh, what are we protecting? Um, we have to make sure that um, that the lives we're protecting from COVID have meaning and purpose. Uh, and that's what I think where we're finding, we're writing this ship a little bit from, um, from the, the really hyper protective mode that we went into right away. And we're realizing that in some ways we're creating a second epidemic of loneliness and isolation and that um, dying alone. And again, thank you to all you who are in, who are doing the work inside the communities who are accompanying people um, as they're passing. But it is really, I think our worst nightmare um, that we're in facing right now. I, also, I just wanted to address somebody who just said that um, basically activity uh, professionals understand the worth and value and, and need to, it's everybody else who needs to catch up to speed. And I, I really want to uh, say yes to that uh, because I think, and that's what we're kind of like, as much as um, our program is about the students providing and providing something unique or, or uh, meaningful for the sites, it is just as meaningful for our students. And I can't tell you how many times our, our, our students have come back and, and talked about how they have thought about uh, their life or even just their parents getting older or themselves, um, they can uh, visualize it. I think we we are so anti-aging, uh, particularly in the, in the US. Um, and, um, and I think that it's, it becomes scary. And that's why there's so, um, you know, uh, there's just a like, I think a little, there's not enough thought going into um, these facilities and this and long term care. And I think the more we can get our young people to think about it and to have this meaningful react uh, interactions, um, the more it, yeah, it will be not just the activity uh, professionals who understand how important um, our, our older adults are. Well, thank you both for an amazing present. And did you want to share anything else? Um, let's see if there's one more slide here. I'm not sure. I can't remember. Oh, sorry. Or if thought... this is the end. Oh, there's the end. So I would just reiterate, um, Carrie Hansen runs our Next Gen program. If people are interested in learning more about it, we'll have um, tons of resources available on time slips for folks who are interested in this program and Carrie is happy to, to chat with people who, who are, again, it's, there is no cost to the care community at all. Um, the, the resource page on timeslips.org is just full of, um, uh, full of free downloadable resources for you at this time. Um, Time Slips also has a list of a, over 150 um, care homes that have asked for our network of artists and caregivers to offer um, cards of inspiration and connection. If you want to join that list, you're welcome to do that and send, send your um, name and address. Um, you'll see it on the um, uh, Get Involved tab. Um, you can do that as well. Um, we're really trying to, to do everything we can to bring meaningful engagement and the tools to you all doing the hard work right now. Um, and yeah, um, thank you for what you do. Um, my hope was that the Student Artist in Residence program as a model is something that can can add another um, octopus arm for you uh, in the impossible job that you have to find meaningful connection to all of your um, elders and residents. Fantastic. Thank you both for this amazing presentation. As we've gone through different great sessions today, we heard about how technology and programming <clears throat> could be words and vehicles and uh, tools for innovation. And we also discussed how has words or attitudes could that be. 
But I think that, and to your point, uh, creativity is essential, obviously. And uh, for me, who is a uh, relatively uncreative person, or anyway, I think of myself like that, it's not the first time that I can tell you that every time you say that if you can breathe, you can create, it is immensely uh, reassuring. And uh, I've always thought that your work is amazing about bringing purpose uh, through for these older adults in these care communities. So thank you both. Katie, a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for contributing today. I am going to um, stop the recording. And Anne and Katie, obviously, the recording will be made available for you. Feel free to share it widely. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Take care now. Take care.